Father, thank the choir for that beautiful rendition there. When I spoke to the choir director, I did not realize that she had something like that in store for me. Just want to say pleasant Sabbath to you all. To our online listeners, I say a pleasant Sabbath to you. The title of the sermon is The Spirit of Prophecy in God's Remnant Church. Let us pray. Almighty God, I ask of you to shield me, put a protection around me as I speak to your people. Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel received a mighty vision from the Lord. And Daniel was told in that vision that after 2,300 days, then the sanctuary be cleansed. In a powerful Sabbath school lesson which we studied a few years ago, there was a precise and interesting overview of this prophecy. The lesson traced this prophecy from the beginning of the 2,300 day prophecy right down to the beginning of God's remnant movement in the earth. I plan to develop this further. In fact, I will say to you, if you ever doubted or wonder if you are members of God's true church, when I finish today, you will never, ever doubt or wonder again. You are going to discover that God pinpointed end time prophecy on his grand time scale to the emergence of his last day church. In Daniel 8.14, God introduces 2,300 day prophecy. He said at the conclusion that the sanctuary would be cleansed. In Numbers 14, verse 34, and Ezekiel 4, verse 6, God indicated in reckoning time prophecy a day stands for a year. So prophetically, Daniel was not dealing with 2,300 literal days, but 2,300 years. The longest time prophecy in all the Bible. It extended from... 457 BC right through until 1844 AD exactly 2300 years now many of you might want to copy that down but before you do if you have been baptized in God's if you have been baptized in this church and you are given one of these when you are baptized you look you got one of these? Well, I suggest you don't copy it down because it's lesson 22, page 56 in this book. Okay? So you don't have to copy that down. Okay? It's right there. Check it out when you go home. Now, in Daniel 9, God sent an angel to explain to the prophet what this longest time prophecy meant. And brothers and sisters, beyond 1844, there are no more time segments to be allowed for. So don't worry if anybody come and tell you anything else. There's no more other time segments allowed for. What I'm trying to say to you is Christ can finish his work anytime he gets ready. And the end can come whenever God is ready. In fact, I would say we are living on borrowed time. Why then has he not come? St. Peter answers the question in 2 Peter 3, chapter 9. He says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us would not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. If there seems to be a delay since 1844, it's not because God has forgotten his word. It's because the world is still in spiritual ignorance and there are good people in all of these different communities that walk in error and because they don't know the truth yet. God forestalls 
and probation is protected. God is simply giving his people time to hear what you have heard. That's why you and I are in church today. And when God sees that every man has had ample opportunity to know his will, make no mistake about it, the end time will come. We must, we don't have to wait on any other time prophecy. The last one ended in 1844. No! That angel said to Daniel, when you consider these 2,300 days, which is in prophecy, are 2,300 years, he said the first 490 years of the 2,300 are cut off for your people, Daniel. So if you look from 457 BC right up to AD 27, that's where you're, that, to AD 34, that's your 490 years, okay? Now, these is cut off to the Jews, either to get themselves with God and be faithful to him, or they will fill up their cup of iniquity and will have to be rejected as God's chosen people. Now, 449 years cut off of this 203,000 year prophecy. As probation time for the Jews as a nation, and then God says, through the angel, the first 483 years will expire and then you will be brought to Messiah, the Prince. Who is the Prince? Who is the Messiah? If you add 483 from 457, you will come down to the year AD 27. Yes? Now, Jesus was not born in AD 27. Instead, he was baptized in AD 27. And up until his baptism, as up until AD 27, until his baptism, as far as the people of Israel were concerned, Christ was just a layman. He was a good man. He was a son of God, but he was without sin and he had not been anointed Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one. But in the year AD 27, the first cousin of Jesus was out in the wilderness preaching and baptizing. His name was John the Baptizer. So they shortened it to call it John the Baptist. That same year when, he, when the hand struck in God's great time prophecy clock, AD 27, while John was standing waist deep in the river Jordan, there approached the river, there approached the river, one who was unlike any other man. And when John saw him, he said to the crowd, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus in AD 27 walked down into the river Jordan and he was baptized of John. And the Bible says when he came up out of the water, he knelt down on the bank and, was, and God threw back the shutters of heaven and made an announcement to the entire world. In Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17, God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And at that same time, the Holy Ghost descended upon Christ, and in the form of a dove, and Jesus is anointed Messiah, the anointed one. He was anointed by the Holy Ghost, ordained by God the Father. It happened in AD 27. Daniel was told that the first 483 years would bring you to the Messiah, the Prince. And right on time, Jesus was ordained and Jesus was anointed as the, and his ministry began. Now, according to this prophecy that Gabriel interpreted, that left one week. How many days are in a week? Seven days in a week. One week of the 2,300 day prophecy left. Now, remember, in reckoning time, prophecy is a day for a year. So when we speak of a prophetic week, seven days, we're literally talking about seven years. Then Daniel was told, in the midst 
in the middle of the week, Messiah would be cut off. Now remember, he was anointed in AD 27. There are seven years left of the 490 years allotted to the Jews to fill up their cup. In the middle of those seven years, Christ would be cut off. Now for all of you who know a little about maths, what is the middle of, of half of seven? Yes, three and a half. Now I'm going to ask you, how long did Jesus preach for? He was ordained and anointed and exactly three and a half years. And just as the angel had told Daniel in the midst of the week, three and a half years after he was anointed by God, Messiah was cut off. And the angel said he would be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus did not die because of his sins. He died because of our sins. The angel said not only would he be, be cut off, he would cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus died, he stopped the killing of lambs. When he died, he stopped the shedding of blood of animals. And when he died, he stopped the killing of doves, pigeons. When Jesus died, he caused sacrifice and oblation to cease. St. Paul says he was once offered for the sins of man. And the blood of Jesus only had to be shed that one time. That's why today, we who believe in Christ do not take lambs to church and slit their throats for our sins. When the Lamb of God died, he caused sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now that left three and a half years, the Jews had three and a half years left when Jesus died. Three and a half years of probation left as a nation, either to accept Christ as the Messiah and the will of God, or to fill up their cup of iniquity and have probation closed for them forever as a nation. Three and a half years left of the 490. I want you to be impressed that sooner or later, man's time will run out. God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And that goes for you and I today. We do not have forever to make up our minds, right? But some of us act like we have forever. The Bible says, even the devil knows he has but a short time. That's why God says, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Behold, now is the accepted time. And so the Jews had three and a half years left of the 490 years when Jesus died on the cross. Three and a half years. I believe that's why the great heart of Jesus was moved with pity. Even though he was hanging there covered with blood and sweat and spit, he was looking down in the faces of madmen. He saw them wagging their heads and he heard them cursing and deriding and mocking and jeering. He caught their maledictions in his ears clearly. And then all of a sudden darkness covered the sun. The earth began to tremble. Lightning flashed. The thunder bellowed. And God came down in shrouding darkness to be near his son on the cross. Whenever God comes down, all he has to do is bear his arms and everything that is against him will be smitten dead. It was as though God would kill them right there. Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, they're running out of time, so forgive them. They don't understand the prophecy, Father. They've only got three and a half years left. They don't understand probation is about to be over. Don't kill them now, Father. Even though they are killing me, let them live, Father. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Christ was, in, was impressed with the fact that the people to whom he had come were running out of time. I want to tell you, 
that prayer was answered by God. He spared their lives that day and just 50 days later, 3,000 of those people joined the church on the day of Pentecost. But the Jews as a nation had three and a half years left. Well, how did they spend it? Repenting? No. Seeing what prophecy had to say? No. How did they spend those three and a half years? They spent them the way they had spent the others, with arrogance, with pride, knowing more than God and putting their opinions ahead of the word and despising those who joined Jesus and his church. Finally, the clock of prophecy struck the hour. The 490 years ended A.D. 34. Would the Jews repent? Would they change? Even though they'd killed the Son of God. Even though they saw the earthquake. Even though they saw the thunder and the lightning. And even though they knew that Christ had risen from the dead. Would they change? The answer is they did not. They despised Christians. They had the disciples beaten. They had them put in jail. They molested Christians wherever they went. And finally, when the clock struck AD 34, right smack on the minute, instead of them turning to Christ and repenting, they went out and took one of the deacons to make an example of him. That deacon name was Stephen. And they took Stephen because he loved Jesus and because he believed in Jesus and because he talked about Jesus. They took deacon Stephen outside the city and they got some great big rocks and now they judge Stephen and they started to stone Stephen to death. And as they were stoning him to death, the Bible says Stephen looked up and he saw heaven open up. And when he, re when he realized what, was, what they were doing, he prayed the same prayer Jesus prayed. Jesus had said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen said, Father, lay not this sin on them. Lay not this charge on them. Stephen was pleading with God for more time, but time had run out. Oh, that very day that they stoned Stephen, the 490 years of Jewish probation ended. And standing in the crowd while they killed Stephen was a man named Saul who was holding the coats. If it, was, it wasn't long after that, he was arrested on the way to Damascus. And God called this learned man and said, now we're not talking to the Jews any longer. I'm moving to the apostles. I'm moving you, the apostle, to the Gentiles. I have rejected the Jews. Their 490 years are up. I will save Jews one at a time, but no longer are they chosen, but no longer are they a chosen people. That's why Paul said to the Gentiles, Jew, Jesus now has torn down the middle wall of partition. He has, he has made of Jew and Gentiles one in Christ Jesus. Now, don't let anybody ask you about Passovers and Pentecost and all those annual Sabbath days. Don't let anybody judge you according to Jewish law. We're now in the Christian era. And I am called to be the apostle of the Gentiles. I'm no longer just Jews, but whosoever will, let him come. And that day probation ended for the Jews. And from that day until this, it has been the apostle to all the world. Now, I've only taken care of the 490 years of the 2,300. Yes? Now, if you subtract 490 from, two, from 2,300, what, what does that leave you? It leaves you 1,810. Now, if you had 1,810 years from AD 34, when the probation ran out for the Jews, then, and when they stoned Stephen, you come right up to 1844, yes? 1844, October 22nd. 
Now this is a very significant date. Up to this date, the people of God went through the Dark Ages. You had the Protestant Reformation. They had broken the stranglehold of the papacy on the world. The word of God was now going out to the common man and people were studying the prophecies. All of a sudden, there came the dark day of May, 17, May 19, 1780. And not long after that, there came the falling stars of the 12th of November, 1833. And when men saw that, they went running to their Bibles to try and figure out what it meant. And when they, when they began to study their Bibles, God revealed to them that there were signs, that, that these were signs that Jesus was getting ready to come back. Now, everybody wanted to know, when is it that he's coming back? And so we find scholars and every denomination began to study. Now you had scholars who began to study their Bibles and, got, and they realized to them that these were signs that Jesus was getting ready. Now, in Daniel, now as they studied, they became convicted that that was the date. As they studied, they became convicted that this was the date that the Lord would return because Daniel had been told that after 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. They took that to mean that Christ was coming and to do away with sin. And they traced the date and computed it to October 22nd, 1844. There was no such thing as a Seventh-day Adventist in those days. There were Baptists, there were Methodists, and there were Congregationalists, just. And there were all of these Protestant churches. They had come out of the mother church. And they are the legitimate daughters of the Roman church. They came, off, they came out of her like daughters. They took the name Protestants, which means, which is supposed to mean that we protest what you teach. But they did not. They held on to the dogma of the teaching. Chiefest of them was Sunday worship. And so they were not Protestants at all. All of a sudden, God tries to wake them up and turn them from man-made traditions to the word of God. And when they looked into the word of God, they began, they became convinced that Christ was getting ready to come and through a mistake, they nailed it to 1844, the end of the 2,300 day prophecy. In that, in Revelation 10, 19, there is a connection with this prophecy, the bittersweet experience. There in Revelation, John was told to take a little book out of the angel's hand and eat it. He was told that when he eat it, it would be sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his belly. When the saints back there in the 1800s began to read and think Christ would come, oh, it became sweet in their mouth. Oh, it was sweet. They thought that they had discovered the very day he would come. And they began to preach it. The Baptists preached it. The Congregationists preached it. The Methodists preached it. And throughout the churches, a common people whose main objective was to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And by the thousand, they joined this group, and they were called Adventists, not Seventh-day Adventists, but Adventists, meaning we believe that Christ is about to make his advent. And it was sweet in their mouths. But when they got down to October 21st, many of them had sold their homes. Many of them had, their, had given away their bank accounts. Many of them had given away their farms. And many of them had given away teams of horses. They knew that in one more day, Christ would return. And they went to the churches that night. And you and I can imagine what you and I would do if you thought Christ would come tomorrow. You would not be as you are today. You would be on your knees confessing your sins. You would be talking to God all night and looking. And that's what they did all night long. But on October 22nd, 1844, the sun came up as usual. The people were out looking up, 
searching the skies, trying to see if the clouds would appear. All day long they were looking, and as, they, and as the day wore on, the dejectors and the mockers and the laughters began to gather around. These people, and they began to make fun of them. And finally got to about three o'clock in the afternoon, and Jesus had not come. After a while, it came to be about five o'clock, and still Jesus had not come. Now, the sun sets very early in October, and they knew that if Jesus did not hurry up and come, they would be disappointed. And finally, they saw the sun, and they saw the sky began to turn red in the west, and the sun began to sink beyond the horizon, and Jesus had not come. All of a sudden, the mocking became deafening. People began to point their fingers. Those who had got free farms and free homes and free horses and free bank accounts were laughing to kill themselves. And these dear people were about to enter into the most distressing thing that they had ever known in their lives. Finally, the sun began to set, and they knew that if Jesus did not come in the next few minutes, they would not see him at all, and they would be disappointed, and they knew that they would have had made a mistake. Now the sun had set, and it got dark, and the stars came out. Jesus had not come. The mocking, the jeering, the laughter intensified, and they realized that they had made a mistake. And now these people who saw that thing that was so sweet in their mouths became bitter in their belly. Some of those same people lost hope forever in Christ. Some of them became atheists. Some of them became infidels. And best, they became agnostics. Some of them say, let's stay together and set up some little group and see what will happen. And so you began to get the Seventh-day Baptists, the Russellites, which became the Jehovah Witnesses. These were products of, this, of the disappointment. It was bitter. Can you imagine how you would have felt if you had thought that Christ was coming that day and he did not return? But out of all of these disillusioned people, they were a little group. Out of all of these people, they were a group of people whose faith were not shaken. They were almost embarrassed to call one another by their name, but they knew each other. They got together and they began to pray. Lord, you don't make mistakes. The errors has to be us. Show us where we went wrong. Lord, show us. Tell us, whatever it is you want to tell us, only reveal it to us. As they prayed and as they fasted, it became clear that one of those leaders of them that's, that made that simple made a mistake in what was to happen in 1844. This was a prophetic day of great significance. It was a time when God's remnant church would be called into being. Because the angel who gave John the bitter sweet experience said, after your belly turns bitter, there's a work to be done. You must prophesy again to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It will not be the end of the time. It will be the time when God's last church will be go into all the world and preach the last warning message. And when they studied, they realized, they re when they studied, God revealed it to them. God showed them that this is not the time for Jesus to come. It is the time for the last message to go out. For men are breaking my commandments and they don't know it. Men are eating things that they shouldn't and they don't know it. Men are drinking and they don't even know it's harmful to their body. Men are smoking and they don't even know it's harmful to them. Men are living contrary to my will. Good men and good women and they don't even know it. So I'm going to call into being a church. 
I'm going to give them a wisdom. Above everything else, I'm going to give them wisdom. Above everything else, I'm going to give them wisdom. And I'm going to give them knowledge of the word of God. I'm going to give them a message that even their enemies cannot confound. I'm going to give them a message that even those who hate them cannot refute it. I'm going to give them a message full of proof. That message is going from God gave to this last day church a message that would stand up. And today I'm happy to tell you on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking. Yeah. As this little group was studying and as God was making things clear, God said to himself, now I finally got myself some folks who I can trust with all of the gifts of the Spirit. He said, I'm going to give them something a lot of folks don't have. And I'm going to read something to you in, 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 in Ephesians 4, verses 8 and 11. Ephesians 4 verses 8 it says wherefore he said when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men right and verse 11 it says and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers Now, this is the giving of the gifts. All right, Lord, we've got this as a church. You gave away the gift of prophecy. You gave away the gift of apostleship. You gave away the gift of teaching. And you gave away the gift of evangelism. We've got that, but why? Why did you give your church that? Listen, in verse 12, it says, For the perfecting of the saints and for the saints are the saints perfect yet? God says, I'm going to give these gifts for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. I want my preachers to be better equipped than ordinary men. I want them to understand the details of prophecy. And anybody can read the general and the broad line, but I want my men to read between the lines. Therefore, I'm going to give them these gifts for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. And God says, edify my church and build it up. Don't just tell them thou shalt not kill. Let them know that if they take poison in themselves, they're killing themselves. Let them know that if they smoke cigarettes, they are killing themselves. Then Lord, why didn't you why didn't you tell them? Because they didn't smoke cigarettes when I finished the Bible. So I'm going to give you another gift so that, that, so that they will understand the details of their commandments in all their broadness will be made plain to folks living in the last generation. Then it says, how long, Lord, are you going to let us have these gifts? How long? Verse 13 says, till. And verse 12 says, for, till we all come in the unity of the faith, are all the children home yet? No. That's why we run evangelistic meeting. That's why we open our baptismal pool and baptize our people so that we can bring more people into the unity of the faith. We're going to run more and more meetings and baptize more and more people until Jesus says, stop. We're going to keep on using these gifts until we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. And that answers your question who was here in prayer meeting last time. Now, then it says in verse 14, it says, Henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You can go to one of the one church is just like another. You can come into a church that is so different. You come into a church that teaches the whole Bible. You've come into a church that teaches 
all of God's law. You come into a church that not only tells you about your soul, but it tells you about what to eat, and it tells you about what to drink, and it tells you what to leave off your body, and it also tells you how to dress. This is the only church that does everything according to how the Bible says, from the front to the back. And I make that note to all of my Bible students. Whenever they come in my Bible class, I say, this is the church that does everything that the Bible says. Okay. Now, God has a holistic message. He wants you to prosper and to be in health even as your soul prospereth. And God says, I have given those gifts for the reason until all my work is finished. Now, the gift of prophecy in 1844 was given to this church. God first gave it to William Ellis Foy, an African American. God's used him for approximately two and a half years and he delivered the message, but folks would not listen. Now you can read about this unknown prophet in the book, the same name by Delbert W. Baker. God then took the message and gave it to Azen Foss, a Caucasian. He refused to obey. The message was too straight. It was too sublime for him to bear it. And that, and by the way, when Azon Foss heard this message being delivered, he said, God told me to deliver this message, and now I'm a lost man. God then turned, he reached down, and he got the weakest of the weak. There was a young woman in this group looking for Jesus to come. Her name was Ellen G. Harmon. Because of an accident when she was just a child, God said she had been given up to die. He said she was subjected to all kinds of illness. She had, to, she had to drop out of school. She had only a year for education, but she loved the Lord. That's why if you have to choose between consecration and education, choose consecration. God chose this young woman who had not gone to school and he laid on her the gift of prophecy. And while they were praying and asking God for light, God caused her to go off in vision. And God told her, I'm depending on you to tell my people. That woman since then has written hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pages and scores and scores of books. And the language is sublime. Yeah. Dr. Billy Graham preaches from desire of ages. Whenever I hear Dr. Billy Graham preach, I sit and I listen to him. And whenever he talks about Jesus on the cross, I say to myself, there goes our prophetess. Because he's quoting her word for word. Brothers and sisters, the gift of prophecy in the remnant church is not another Bible. She never called herself a prophet on par with John the Revelator or with Daniel. But she said, I am the Lord's servant and he has given me messages to make his word clear. Not a new Bible, but light shed upon greater light. Amen. Well, now you know she was, well, how do you know she was a prophet? What are some of the signs of a person who is a true prophet? I'm going to give them to you fast. Number one, the sign is that a true prophet will not use the gift to become rich. They're not going to sell advice and counsel. A true prophet is not going to make so much money that she's going to go off and buy great big ranches. That's the first sign. Another is not only do they not seek personal uh, fortune, but they don't seek personal fame. They don't do it to become big shots or to get written up in history books. Another one is a true prophet will always glorify Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, I'll put a challenge to all our new believers I read and read one of her books, Steps to Christ. Over 12 million copies have been sold in hundreds of languages. I want you to read it and I want you to judge for yourself if the Lord's servant glorifies Christ. I want you to judge for yourself if a year four student could write in such sublime language. I want you to read it and you be the judge. I want you to see if the prophet is lifted up or if Jesus is lifted up. But, but the
the supreme work is desire of ages. One day it said that somebody went into the Library of Congress, that's in the USA, and they spoke to the man in charge of the religious library. And they said to him, who is the great, what is the greatest and grandest biography of Christ in all, the library, in all of the Library of Congress? He responded, that's easy. It's Desire of Ages by Ellen G. White. This book is too little read and too little understood. If you have it at home, start reading it. I challenge you, don't take my word for it. Not only that, the Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to my word, it's because there's no light in them. In other words, whoever calls himself a prophet must never contradict God's Ten Commandments and never contradict the rest of the Bible. Anybody else who says he is a true prophet and writes contrary to the word of God, is not a true prophet at all. A true prophet will never contradict the word of God. Whenever God raises up a true prophet, the devil always raises up one too. God gave marriage, the devil gave common law. God gave the Sabbath, the devil gave the first day of the week. When God gave us a true prophet in the last days, the devil ran and got himself one. And among them was Mary Baker Eddy of the Christian Science Church. She began to prophesy and about the same time that the gift of prophecy was placed in the remnant church and alongside her was also Joseph Smith of the Mormon Church. They began to do their work the same time that Ellen White was called to be the prophet of this remnant church. And the only way to tell if the prophet was true or false was to see if they stayed with the Bible. Mary Baker Eddy taught things that were contrary to the word of God. She could not be a prophetess. Joseph Smith thought it was all right to have 25 or 30 wives. The Bible contradicts that. I'd rather stand with the word of God than go with the Mormons. The Mormons teach you can be baptized for the dead. The Bible teaches, whatsoever thy hands find it to do, do it with thy might, for there is no wisdom or knowledge in the grave, whither thou goest. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. Because, because all these prophets contradict the word of God, they have to be characterized as false prophets. Now, the next way you can tell if a true prophet is a true prophet is whatever they prophesy, Whatever they declare must come to pass. Amen. That has always been God's system. God says, I declare it before it happens and proves that I am Lord. Amen. A true prophet makes a prediction. It has to happen. Way back then, we were just, when we were just a handful of people just getting started, God told a true prophet, that this message would belt around the world. God told the true prophet, when we, when we just printed a few magazines and handed them out, she said the publishing word would belt the entire world and the printed word would go out like the leaves of autumn. It has happened. Publishing houses in over 800 languages and dialects. There are hundreds and thousands of people who spread the printed word every day, just as the Lord had prophesied. That isn't all. Whenever a true prophet speaks, and whatever a true prophet says, must, might be discounted for a while, but when God behind the thing, you can put a pin in it. Way back yonder, God's prophet said, cancer was a virus. The medical profession laughed. Today, the medical profession has finally caught up with Ellen White. They are saying cancer is a virus. Way back yonder, when everybody thought it was cool to smoke cigarettes, the servant of the Lord says that nicotine was a deliberating drug. 
that it was harmful to the brain, it was harmful to the body, and the world laughed. And for years, as we preached it, they laughed at us. And all of a sudden, they caught up with the spirit of prophecy. All of a sudden, every packet of cigarette, there's a health warning. It is dangerous to your health. On every billboard advertising, there's a warning. It is dangerous to your health. When we knew that so long ago, how did we know? We got it from the spirit of prophecy. Now the last thing, a true prophet, now the last thing about a true prophet, they have to live right. You're not a prophet when people find out you're living a dirty life. You ought to read some of the autobiography of some of these other prophets. Even the enemies of Ellen White decided she was a Christian if ever there was one. There was a man who was a member of this church. He was a minister of the gospel. But for fame and fortune, he, fl he flattered into departing from the faith. His name was Kenwright. He had been one of the ministers of this church. He had been associated with this woman and her husband. He had been a powerful leader and a very gifted man. But the Baptist church came along and offered him a great big building, bigger than he ever had. They offered him money such as he had never had before. They told him to write a book against the faith and that they would pay him to write this book. And Ken Wright did like a lot of folks. He sold out to the devil. Then the servant of the Lord said to him, Brother Ken Wright, repent. He wouldn't repent. Finally said to him, Brother Ken Wright, your son will set in obscurity. Brothers and sisters, that man was crippled. He lost his family. He came down to poverty. The books didn't sell. And whenever he wanted food, he walked into the back door of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, one of our hospitals, in order to get a free handout from the church. He denounced. He died like a tramp. But Ellen White died before he did. And she was buried from the Battle Creek Tabernacle. And when he found out she had died, he came back to the funeral. He came to the funeral. And he wept all the way down the aisle. And he stood there with his hands on the coffin and tears dropping down into the coffin. And he said, in the hearing of all those gathered at the funeral, he said, there is a good woman. There is a child of God. They had to drag him away from the coffin. He asked to be allowed to go back one more time. He turned around. And he went back and stood there with his tears running down into the coffin. And surely, as God lived, the sun did set in obscurity. He died like a tramp. It does not pray to kick against the pricks. You can't stop the work of the Lord by kicking. All you're going to do is breed mortification in your big toe. All you're going to do is hurt yourself. You cannot denounce what God has built up. You cannot turn back what God has begun. God gave to this church through the gift of prophecy the details that were left out of our Bible so that we might have the unity of the faith. That one of the reasons, that's all us preachers preach the same message. That's why around the world, this church has one faith, one Lord, one baptism. No other church has it. You can go anywhere in London today, pull 10 pastors of the same church, and they will all have different views on heaven and hell and everything else. But in this church, we believe one message. What is, why is that? Because God gave to this church that we might be brought into the unity of the faith. Therefore, beloved, I conclude this message today with this statement from 2 Chronicles 20 verse 20. Believe his prophets 
so shall ye prosper. Some people hate the spirit of prophecy the way they hate the Bible. The reason they hate it is because it condemns sin. And the Bible seems to let them slide a little bit. The Bible appeared to let them go by because it didn't go into details. The Bible doesn't say anything about gangster rap or hip hop. The Bible doesn't say anything about wild music. So people who are looking for loopholes will say, there is nothing wrong with hip hop or gangster rap or wild music because the Bible didn't say anything about it. That is why God sent the spirit of prophecy to fill in the details. God sent the spirit of prophecy to talk about things that only this generation knows about. And they don't like it. They consider it cold water. They consider it a hindering cause. They consider it something that takes the sparkle out of life. They don't like the spirit of prophecy for the same reason sinners don't like the Bible. They condemn it because much of it condemns them. Brothers and sisters, if God's word is too straight for you, if the spirit of prophecy is too straight for you, have how are you going to abide in that sendeth? If the spirit of prophecy is too holy, how are you going to abide Jesus who is the holy of the holiest? If you can't stand the message of the servant of the Lord, how are you going to stand the word of the Lord himself? I thank God today for everything he has done for the remnant church and you know what by his grace I plan to go through all the way Amen.